It's, maybe, uh, maybe we wait a okay. maybe we wait a couple of more minutes because people are still coming in. I think. Here's Alfredo. No, no, but uh, people uh, okay. come come all the time a little late. Uh, that okay, so so we start. Yes. Okay. okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this invited uh, talk by delivered by by my good friend Julio Rossi. Julio Rossi is a a professor, a food professor at the University of Buenos Aires. He's a a very good friend of mine also. So I very much appreciate. And it's a pleasure to me to introduce him in this talk about asymptotic mean value properties for nonlinear partial differential equations. Julio. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be introduced by a good friend, of course. Okay, I, at the beginning, I want to thank, warmly thank the scientific committee for giving me the opportunity to give this talk today. For me, it's a pleasure and also an honor to, to deliver this talk, to give this talk. I will talk about the, the title is there. I will talk about asymptotic mean value properties for nonlinear partial differential equations. And this is uh, results made in collaboration with Pablo Blanc from Shibaskila University in Finland, Fernando Charro from Detroit, and Juan Manfredi from Pittsburgh in the US. And I want also to thank all my co authors because for me it's a pleasure to work with them, to, with uh, all of you, with all my co authors. Okay, from the title, asymptotic mean value properties for nonlinear partial differential equations. The plan of the talk is as follows. I will spend, the, let me say, the first 10 or 15 minutes talking about classical results that are the uh, mean value formulas for the Laplacian or for harmonic functions. Uh, but I will give you some, some sort of versions of these uh, mean value formulas that are not so common in, in, the, in the books, in the elementary books, textbooks. Okay, next I will pass to the, to the main, uh, uh, this, this is just like the appetizer of the, of the talk. The main course of the talk is the mean value formulas for Monchamper equations, which is a non-local nonlinear partial differential equations. I'm going to talk about it a, a little later and I will present both results uh, for parabolic Monchampera, for the elliptic case of Monchampera. And this will be the core of the talk. So this is the main dish of the, of the meal. And as a dessert, I, I can also offer you some connection with probability and show you how you can approximate solutions to Monchampera using uh, game theory. Okay, that is the plan of the talk. Uh, coffee is also included, but uh, wine is not included. So sorry about that. I will not give you the full proofs of the results, but only show you some ingredients that appears in the proof. And as, as you can see, the ingredients are going to be very elementary ingredients. So this is like a healthy food. Okay, let us uh, start with the talk about the classical mean value formula for the Laplacian. Along all this talk, we will talk about differential equations, PDEs of this form that these are functions defined in a, as we say, a bounded open set in Rn, so in n variables, real valued. And uh, what is a PDE? For me, a PDE during this talk will be a relation between the point, the function itself, the gradient of the function. This is the vector formed by the first derivative, the Hessian. The Hessian is the matrix, n times n symmetric matrix formed by the second derivatives of your function, and this will be, will be a PDE. And I will not talk uh, explicitly on in which sense we understand solutions to this PDE. So for experts, solutions of this PDE will be understood in the viscosity sense. But if you are not familiar with the viscosity sense, just think about classical solutions and this will be okay. So functions that are C2 and that when you compute the function and the first derivative and the second derivative, and you plug the, all this into this relation capital F, this is equal to zero all over the place, all over omega. So what is the first theorem uh, says? The first theorem is the classical mean value formula for the Laplacian. 
and it says that a function u is harmonic. What is the Laplacian? The Laplacian is the trace of d to u. So you see that it fits into this format. You take the matrix of the second derivative and you compute the trace and you say that the trace is equal to zero in terms of the derivative. This is the sum of the pure second order derivatives of u with respect to the n variables that you are considering in, in omega and array. So the classical mean value formula says that u is a solution to the Laplacian equals to zero if and only if, and I will recall the remark, the if and only if, the if and only if is very important here, is if and only if u of x is the mean value it, at every ball centered at x. So by, by this uh, integral with a slash, I will denote the mean value of a function and this is one over the measure of the ball times the integral of u in the ball, but I will not write one over the measure of the ball, the integral in the ball every time. So I will use the notation of uh, the integral with a backslash. And, and this, this uh, theorem is, uh, let me say, amazing, remarkable, wonderful, outstanding, whatever good qualificative you want to make, it applies to this result. Because you see here, it says that a function verifies a local property because this, this, is, this, uh, this, this first line, it's a combination of derivatives of your function. So to look if your function verifies the equation at some point x, you only need to know what are the values of u in a, close, in a small neighborhood around the point. But this local uh, property implies a non-local property because to check if the function u is the mean value at every possible ball containing the omega, you can consider balls that are small close to the point, but balls that are quite large as well. So here you will have a, a, a property that to check it, you have to know the values of u in the whole collection of balls containing the omega. So you have to know the values of u far away from the point. On the other half, the, the, oh, the other implication is also remarkable because here in this mean value formula, you don't see any derivatives, okay? Derivatives are there because you have an if and only if, but you don't see any explicit form of the derivatives. And if you can check that your function verifies the mean value formula all over around the balls containing the omega, then it has to be harmonic. That means then this particular combination of the second derivatives of your function has to be equal to zero. So this formula is, is uh, in my opinion, at least is amazing because it relates to things, one that is local and is a PDE with derivatives with one property that it is not local and it involves only integrals or mean, value, mean values in balls around omega. So, okay, let me go to the next slide. In the next slide, we can relax a little bit the second statement, the mean value formula and uh, obtain the following, the following thing that is an asymptotic mean value formula. What is an asymptotic mean value formula? It's the following thing. A function u is harmonic in the domain omega. For, it's the same as before for x inside omega and this is for x inside omega as well. So the function is harmonic if and only if the, the value of the function at some point is this not exactly equal to the value of the function in every ball but if you take a small balls of radius epsilon around the point and you let epsilon goes to zero, then the equality holds up to a small error. And this small error, little o of epsilon squared, is just a notation to say that uh, this little o of epsilon squared is a quantity such that when you divide by epsilon squared, it goes to zero. So when, when I wrote, write this, this line here, what I mean is that the difference between u of x and the mean value, even divided by epsilon squared, goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So the meaning of uh, u of x equals to the mean value plus a little o of epsilon squared as epsilon goes to zero means exactly this limit, but I will not write this limit at every, at every step, at every, at every moment in this talk. I will just write this, this form of the asymptotic mean value property. And in doing that, you feel more comfortable because uh, you see a, a 
local property implies a local property because when epsilon goes to zero, the balls are shrinking around the point. So to evaluate if a function u verifies this asymptotic mean value formula, you only need to know the values of u in a small ball around the, around the point x. And, and vice versa, no? but the key thing is that you still have an if and only if. And as you can see, we are relaxing a little bit this thing, this, this mean value property, because we are not asking that the mean value property holds for every possible ball, but it holds in an asymptotic uh, sense. So this is an asymptotic mean value property. Okay, it is more than that. You, you can also obtain the characterization of an inequality and say, okay, uh, a function is subharmonic, so the Laplacian of u is bigger or equal than zero inside omega, so an inequality, not an equality, if and only if, and again, you have this if and only if that I will have to remark every time because this is the, the mean value property, the asymptotic mean value property holds, but with an inequality. So you have that the same limit that you had before, this limit that is equal to zero implies that the Laplacian is equal to zero. Now you have that the lim sup of one over epsilon squared, the mean value minus u of x is bigger or equal than zero implies an inequality for the Laplace. And the same happens for the reverse inequality because you just multiply by minus one and everything works. So super harmonic, that means that the Laplace is less or equal than zero is equivalent to the lim inf less or equal than zero. So you have a, a, let me say, an equivalence between being super, super harmonic with an asymptotic mean value formula for the solution, so for sub and super solutions of the equation. Okay, you can do a little more. So more than that, you can do it with a discrete version of the mean value formula that reads as follows. A function used harmonic in your domain omega, if and only if, again, the if and only if appears, u of x is the mean value between this discrete collection of points and the collection of points is formed in the following way. You take a canonical basis in Rn, so in R2, you take the canonical basis, and then you make one step of size epsilon to the left, one step to the right, one step up or one step down, and you take the mean between these four points. Uh, let me put the four fingers in the right way so you can see the four points in the, the screen. So these are the four points in which you are computing the mean value, and again, you have that u of x is the mean value in the four points plus the little law of epsilon square that is always there because those are asymptotic mean value forms. And here you, you feel a little more comfortable, even more comfortable than before because this formula is also local. The, the, as epsilon goes to zero, the points are very close to the center, to the origin to, to x. And uh, you, you can see discretization of the second order derivatives or second derivatives up to second order center differences. If you are familiar with numerical analysis there, you can recognize the, the second derivative in the direction of the vectors in the canonical basis. And this gives you the pure second derivatives of your function. So this is the closest, uh, let's say the closest thing to having the second derivatives. There you can see something that seems like second derivatives. Okay, about the linear results, you can do the same things as the replacing the Laplacian by an equation with coefficients. So if you have a linear equation, a linear combination of the second derivative with some matrix A, A, J as coefficients there, you can do the same thing, but you have to replace the ball in this uh, mean value formulas, let me say in this value formulas with the ball or in the previous one with the, with the ball here, by some ellipsoids that are related to the matrix AAJ. And in, in, this, in this slide, this short line in the slide say linear results, I have to say that I will assume that the matrix AAJ is elliptic. And uh, I will assume that all the equations that I will talk about are elliptic in the sense that F of d to u is monotone with respect to the d to u. Uh, you, you need some monotonicity of the equation and you're restricted to second order uh, differential equations. So second order differential equations with monotonicity in the matrix. This is what you, you can handle with this uh, mean value formula. 
Okay, up to now, this is this is the appetizer, and this is those are mean value formulas for linear problems. So I will try to convince you that this also works for nonlinear things. Uh, up to now, if you have questions, comments, remarks, or whatever you want to say, please unmute and mute yourself and, and shoot. Say whatever you want. I, I will not uh, take an eye in the in the chat. So please don't write in the chat. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and say, Julio, I want to ask something, and it's going to be OK. So let us go to the main dish. Let us go straight to the point, to the nonlinear thing. OK, what is the nonlinear thing that I will talk about? This is the mont -Jamper equation. What is the mont -Jamper equation? The mont -Jamper equation is instead of prescribing that the trace of the matrix, the trace of D2U is equal to 0, we are prescribing that the determinant of D2U is equal to some data f of x, f of x is given, f is assumed to be non-negative, and the domain is going to, to, to be a convex domain. So you can think about a ball if you want, by omega. Okay, what, what is this equation? What is saying this equation? This equation is in terms of the eigenvalues of the Hessian is saying that the product of the eigenvalues, the, remember that the Hessian is an n times n real matrix that is symmetric, so it is diagonalizable. All the eigenvalues are real, and you can compute the eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda n, and you can take the product of the eigenvalues, and this is, has to be equal to f at every point inside the domain. Okay, we, we are going to restrict ourselves to convex solutions, and there are two reasons for doing that. The first one is that when you restrict yourself to convex solutions, the, the problem is well posed. That is to say, the Dirichlet problem with the boundary data is well posed for this equation. And there you can see an example where, where this, this particular thing happens. So if you take f identically equal to one in two dimensions, this function is a solution. So this u of x1, x2 is a solution to the mont -Jamper equation because the Hessian of x1 squared plus x2 squared over 2 minus 1 is the identity. If you take the second derivative of these functions, it's quite simple to compute. This is a second a polynomial, second degree polynomial. You compute the second derivative that this gives you the identity. So the product of the eigenvalues or the determinant of the identity is exactly equal to one. But if you do the same with this V, that is one minus, so this is V is minus U, so you reverse the sign, it, it also holds because you see the Hessian now is minus the identity. So the determinant of minus the identity is also equal to one. So the equation is verified by the two functions and the two function vanishes on the, the boundary of the ball of radius one. So you have two different solutions, one that is convex and the other one that is concave, that are solutions, classical solutions to your equation, determinant of D2U equals to one, in this case in R2. Okay, you don't want to have two solutions, so you want to keep only one, you, you restrict yourself to convex solutions. And there is another reason, is that when you restrict yourself to convex solutions, this determinant of D2U it's monotone with respect to D2U. So this ellipticity, this monotonicity with respect to the matrix of the second derivative is okay when you restrict yourself to convex functions and convex functions are functions such that all the eigenvalues are bigger or equal than zero. And this is the case because if you have one direction in which you have one of the second derivative that is negative, then your function looks like this in this direction and it cannot be convex. So if you restrict to convex functions, then all the eigenvalues of your function or all the eigenvalues of D2U are uh, bigger or equal than C. So you are restricting yourself to this, but in this, uh, with this restriction, saying that you are looking for convex solutions of mont -Jamper equations, then you have a elliptic equation for which you have existent uniqueness and good properties of the solution to the Dirichlet problem. Okay. So this is the mont -Jamper equation. This is the main character of, of this movie. Uh, I, I, don't, I am not sure if this is the hero or, or the bad guy of the movie. You, you can decide whatever you want, but 
this is the main character and I will devote the rest of the talk to talk about this equation, this particular equation. Okay, so the, the first, let us go straight to the point and first theorem, the first uh, asymptotic mean value formula for Monchamper. What is this? Uh, you fix a function P such that the limit of phi epsilon goes to plus infinity as epsilon goes to zero, but when you multiply by epsilon, epsilon times phi epsilon goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. If you don't want to think about any function epsilon, you think about a concrete example, you take epsilon to the minus one half and epsilon to the minus one half will, will do the work for you. It works and you can fix this function if you want in the statement. And the statement, the theorem says, Okay, if you have a function that is C2, so we are talking about classical solutions in this theorem, the determinant of D2U is equal to F inside your domain omega. So you have a classical solution to the Monchamper equation with F, if and only if, and again, the if and only if is remarkable, if and only if you have a mean value pro formula. And the mean value formula says the following, I have to spend a little time describing the mean value formula for you. The value of u at the center of the balls at, at this x is the infimum among all possible matrices. A, capital A is a matrix with determinant equal to one, non-negative matrices, positive matrices that are symmetric. So A is a symmetric positive matrix with determinant equal to one and less or equal than phi epsilon times the identity. And this phi epsilon is this one, this phi that goes to plus infinity as epsilon goes to zero. And you are computing the mean in the ball of radius epsilon around the origin of u evaluated at this kind of points. So x plus the matrix times y. And, and the matrix is inside your function u. In the next slide, I will try to explain you a little better, a little more. Yeah, sure, you have questions, please. Uh, tiny question, in what sense is a less than or equal phi e identity. Okay, you, you mean you by take... less for a matrix? Yeah, for, for a matrix. I, I can, will call a matrix to be non-negative, bigger or equal than zero, if the matrix times B times V is bigger or equal than zero. Ah, okay, so the, the, so the difference is a positive operator. That's what you mean. Yeah, the, the difference is a positive matrix in okay. this sense. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a positive operator. If those are matrices in Rn. Yeah, so yeah, 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 in, in Rn. An n times n matrix in Rn. So this is the, this is okay. the, in, in, the, in this sense, no? The matrix times V times V transpose is bigger or equal than zero for every V. So thank you for the question. And uh, okay, there you see the matrix in, in the, in the mean value formula appears the matrix and you want to take the infimum among all these possible matrices. Okay, you, the, the right hand side of the equation, this f of x enters into the formula because it has to be there, but it enters to the one over n. So this power one over n has to, has to is related to the homogeneity of the equation because the determinant of d2u is homogeneous of degree n. So this one over n, if you multiply a function u by some constant k, the the second derivative gets multiplied by k, but the determinant is gets multiplied by k to the n. So let k out of the determinant, you have to write to the power n. So this one over n is related to this homogeneity of the, of the equation. And in front of f, you see the epsilon square and a, and a universal constant that depends only on the dimension, but has to be there. And of course, the little law of epsilon square also appears in this formula. In this formula. One, one thing that I have to, to mention is that the equation is nonlinear, but also the mean value formula is nonlinear because you are computing the infimum in front of the integral. The integrals are linear, but the infimum of all these integrals is a nonlinear thing. Okay, let, let me comment a little bit of what are the sets that are involved in this mean value formula. When you take the mean value in the ball of radius epsilon of u evaluated at this point x plus a y, you can change variables and use that the determinant of a is equal to one to obtain that the integral is equal to the mean value in this set e epsilon that depends on the matrix and depends on the point as well that are that are ellipsoids centered at x. 
So what, uh, what are you doing? You are taking the ball of radius epsilon, a small ball of radius epsilon. You are multiplying by A, the points in the ball of radius epsilon. So you get an ellipsoid center at the origin, but you multiply by something bigger in one direction. You have to multiply by something smaller than one in the other direction because the determinant has to be equal to one. And then you add X. And when you add this, this little X, you are moving everything and you are centered at X. So this is a family of ellipsoid that is centered at the point X and it depends on the matrix A. And you are taking the infimum among all possible matrices with determinant equal to one and with this restriction that the matrix is less or equal than phi epsilon times the identity. Okay, as epsilon goes to infinity, when epsilon gets smaller and smaller, so this asymptotic regime, as epsilon goes to zero, this restriction, you don't care very much because the set of matrices that are allowed in your infimum is bigger and bigger, gets bigger and bigger. But as epsilon, as epsilon goes to zero, this formula is local because if you take the distance between a point in the ellipsoid and the center, you obtain the distance between the point of this shape, of this form, x plus a y to the center to x. This is the matrix times y, and since the point y is in the ball of radius epsilon, and the matrix is assumed to be less or equal than phi epsilon times the identity, then you obtain the epsilon times phi epsilon that goes to zero. So all these ellipsoids are shrinking around the point, are very small, close to the points so of this formula, this this formula here is a local asymptotic mean value formula for that characterizes solution to Mont Champagne. Okay, you can also have a non-local version of this thing. And for the non-local version of this thing, the only thing that you change is that you impose that the ellipsoids are contained inside omega. But in here, taking only ellipsoids contained inside the domain omega, you are considering ellipsoids that can be very thin in one direction and the diameter of the ellipsoid that we say is, is of order one because you can shrink the ball of radius epsilon a lot in one direction but uh, you, you have to extend it a lot in the other direction so you compress in one direction you extend in the other because the determinant has to be equal to one remember that that is the condition the key condition and you are con considering this infimum, and this infimum also works the same constant as before, the same homogeneity as before, and this is again an if and only if with the with the with the Monchian pair equation. And of course, you have again this little of epsilon square. And even if this formula may look like a local formula because you have this little of epsilon square, when you are evaluating this infimum, when you are computing this infimum for you, you need to know the values of you in every possible ellipsoid centered at X contained in omega. And this ellipsoid uh, covers a lot of regions when, when, when you compute this. Even for epsilon very small, you can reach far away points with this ellipsoid. So this formula, this is an asymptotic mean value formula, but this is a non-local asymptotic mean value formula but also characterizes solutions to Mont Champer equation. And uh, well, this, this is the main result. The, the main stuff in this, uh, in this talk is this slide that says that here we are only assuming that U is continuous and we are talking about viscosity sub and super solutions to the equation. So the following are equivalent. You have a sub and super solution. So you have an, an inequality for Monge and Pair equation in the viscosity sense, if and only if you have an inequality for the first mean value formula, which is the local mean value formula with the restriction that the matrix is less or equal than this phi epsilon times the identity. And this is if and only if the, the local mean value formula also holds with an inequality. So you have a full characterization with two different mean value formula, one that is local and the other that is not local to uh, viscosity subsolutions are of course super solutions if you reverse the inequalities of Monge and Pair equations. And one thing that I have to comment here is that everything works in this slide, everything works in the viscosity sense. And I am not describing exactly what is the viscosity sense. So for experts, you probably know better than me what is the viscosity sense of these equations. But for non experts, let me say that those are classical solutions and that, that's. Uh, 
that's okay. So you can also characterize inequalities and you can, you can say when a function is a viscosity solution or a solution in terms of asymptotic mean value form. One, one, yeah, when, sure. Oh. See, in a, a little tiny sure. question. When, so you say U is just continuous, mm -hmm. right? So when you make the derivative, is you probably taking some distribution or what? No, you, you are computing. But then I don't yeah. understand the inequality. Of course, you, you have to take uh, this, this inequality, the determinant of D2U. What is D2U if U is only continuous? D2U may not even exist. Yeah. That's completely right. This yeah. has to be interpreted in the viscosity sense. What is the viscosity sense? I have to say something because you ask it. You have your function U, you touch your function from above or from below with a paraboloid or with some function that has second derivative at the point that you are touching. And you ask for this inequality, but instead of D2U, you take the second derivative of the touching function that is a smooth from above or below. And what you are using in mm -hmm. some sense is when two functions, two smooth functions touch at one point, so you are touching with a smooth function another smooth function, then the gradient of the two functions is the same because U that minus V has a minimum at that point. A, and the, the second yeah. derivatives are ordered. Because if U minus V has a minimum at some point, then the second derivative has to be non-negative. So the second, if the, you, are, you have a classical solution, you have some ordering. If you don't have a classical solution, well, okay, you act as if it were a classical solution the touching function when you plug it here will satisfy this equation. So this is a sort of, those are not distributional derivatives. Those are this is a derivative in the viscosity sense. That are, you, you are taking test functions, a smooth test function that touches the graph of your continuous function from above or below. And you are using them to plug them into the equation and see if the inequality holds or not. So yeah, you are completely right in this statement. This D2U does not make any sense. It makes sense only when you touch your function from above or from below with a smooth function. So I, at the end, I had to explain something about this viscosity stuff I, that I, I wanted to skip un, under the carpet. But ah. so thank you for asking anyway. Okay, this, uh, this is the characterization, the full characterization of the solutions of super solution of the motion pair equations in terms of two different uh, mean value properties. And let me go to, to the next one. You also want a discrete because for the Laplacian, you have a discrete mean value formula and you also have it here. This is the discrete version of the previous uh, thing. You take the infimum among all possible orthonormal bases in Rn. So you take three directions in R3. And you take coefficients alpha one, alpha n in this set. And the coefficients has to verify that the product of the coefficients is equal to one. So here you, this product of the coefficients equal to one looks like having the determinant equal to one. And you ask the square root of the coefficients to be less than phi epsilon. In fact, the analogous to the eigenvalues of the matrix A that you had before are these square roots of the alpha. And there you see that you are evaluating your function u at a certain collection of two endpoints that in one direction can be very far away, but in the other direction has to be close because the, in one direction you are multiplying by the square root of alpha one, and in the other direction you are multiplying by the square root of the other of alpha two, but the product alpha one times alpha two in R2 has to be equal to one. So this is the discrete version that holds for the Laplacian also holds here. Okay, so uh, up to now, comments, questions, comments, something, something extra, something that I, I don't remember that uh, I have to say that I have to do something. No, okay, let, let me continue. This is the, the slide in which the main ingredients in the proof appear, so this is the, the uh, the, the time where the kitchen, the kitchen is not open. I will not show you the, the whole proof of the result, but I will show you what are the ingredients that appear. The first thing, those are 
quite simple things, quite elementary things. If you take the mean value of a constant, it gives you a constant. This is obvious. The mean value in the ball centered at the origin of a linear function gives you zero because the function is even and the ball is symmetric. And when you compute a second order polynomial, let's just say that matrix times y times y, and you compute the mean value of the ball, you obtain epsilon square, this constant, n plus two times the trace of the, of the matrix. And uh, the other ingredient is this uh, identity that comes from an elementary linear algebra that says that when you are computing the infimum of traces of A transpose M A with determinant equal to one, you obtain the determinant of the matrix M as long as the matrix is non-negative. So M has to be bigger or equal than zero here. If M is, is not bigger or equal than zero, then this infimum gives you minus infinity. Okay, so with these two ingredients, now I have to try to convince you that the result is true. And this is not a proof. In here, uh, I'm cheating because this, this is not a proof and this is not a, the main, the, the complete argument is not there, but uh, something could be arranged and, and it can be done, but uh, okay. So take the case where your function is C2, so you can compute second derivative and that the Hessian is strictly positive. So you're taking two things in total. Uh, if you compute the second order Taylor expansion of U, you get U of X, the gradient U, around the point X and the Hessian times C times minus X, C minus Z transpose. And then you take the mean value of U in this, at this point, this is the, the, the thing that you want to take the infimum after that. Okay, if you trust in Taylor expansions, you may say that this is more or less like integrating, taking the mean value of the second order Taylor expansion of your function. And when you compute the second order Taylor expansion, this is what you get because you are taking x plus a y, but you are subtracting x, you are centered at x. So the minus x that you have here disappears and you are only left with a y. The first thing you are using the first property, the mean value of a constant is a constant. The mean value of a linear function vanishes. So this term vanishes, you are quite happy. And the mean value of the quadratic thing you take this A to the other side as A transpose here, and you get the trace. This is the second, this, so those are the first time with this ingredient. The integral of a constant is a constant. The mean value of a linear function is zero. The mean value of a quadratic thing is that gives you the trace. So the mean value of U at this point has to be more or less like this thing. And now you're computing the infimum. When you take the infimum, you take the infimum at, in, in this side, you get this infimum that appears in your mean value formula, but this has to be more or less, this is the more or less that you had before, u of x is a constant that goes outside and the infimum of the traces gives you the determinant of d2 u to the one over n. When you take the infimum among all matrices A with determinant equal to one. And the one over n is the one over n that appears due to the homogeneity. Now you replace the determinant of d to u by the f of x, if u is a solution to mont -Jamper, and you have the, the mean value formula because u at the point x is the infimum of these mean values minus, because you have to take this on the other side, minus this uh, epsilon square, the universal constant that depends on n, f of x to the one over n. Why I'm cheating a little bit because in here you have to take a special care because you want the error to be a little low of epsilon square. And the fact that it is a little low of epsilon square is, uh, is important in this theorem. It's really needed. And in doing that with this computation, it's not that, uh, not, not that straightforward. Okay, they are now about parabolic von Schamper. Those are side dishes of the previous result. And the, side, the first side dish is, is the first following formula for this version of the parabolic von Schampere equation. To my surprise, when I, when I started looking at this thing, there are two versions of parabolic von Schampere and both kind of equations are called parabolic von Schampere equations. So the first one is this one, you add a time derivative. So you add some extra variable that is time here and you ask a function that depends on X and T 
So the time derivative of u equals the determinant of d to u. This d to u goes the derivative with respect to x of your function u. So you're taking the determinant of d to u to the one over n plus some random side f of xt. And for this uh, parabolic version of Monchamper, we have again an if and only if, and the if and only if is a characterization of viscosity solution. So this is important again as a mean value formula. At some point xt, you have the infimum, you have to add another mean value. So you have the same mean value as before at the same point x plus a y that gives you the determinant of d to u as before and you integrate in time and when you integrate in time you are using times that are uh, less than t so here you can see the parabolic nature of this mean value formula as well and the interval in which you are integrated is not symmetric with respect to t so some first order derivative survives when you are doing this uh, this kind of Taylor expansion. The same constant as before, and the, the rank and side f of x, and the little o of epsilon squared that has to be there because this is an asymptotic mean value property for parabolic. The second version of parabolic von Schampere is even more involved because it has minus the time derivative times the determinant of d to u. So you are not adding, you are multiplying this thing. This is a parabolic version of Mohr Schampere equals a rank and side f. This is given. And okay, your function u is a viscosity solution to this monster, if and only if you have again a mean value formula characterization in which you are taking a time interval and the time interval depends on an extra parameter. This is small b and the small b appears in the infimum and you ask for the determinant of your matrix times the small b to be equal to one. And the constant is different and also the homogeneity is different here because this is homogeneous of degree n plus one now. But the same thing could be done for this for this kind of problem. Okay, now I'm going to switch into probability. Uh, let me go for the dessert. How much time do I have? I have, oh, no, very good, very good. So let me describe you a game or a control problem in which you, you may find solutions or approximations to solutions of motion per equation. Okay, well, what are the rules of the game? You can play the game in, uh, in your house if you want, or you can pretend that you're playing when I'm talking. Okay, you fix a, a convex domain omega. You have two functions. One is the final cost given by G, define it in the exterior of your domain, and one running payoff, small f, that is defined inside your domain. You fix a parameter, epsilon, small, but this is fixed. You start from some initial position in your domain, it's not that omega, and then you want to move. What, is, what are the rules? When you move, you choose, you are the player or you are the controller, you, I pointed at you with my finger, you choose an orthonormal basis, V1, Vn, whenever you want. So you choose two directions in R2. You can choose the, the two canonical directions and you can choose any two directions in R2. Let me put it in this way. You can choose two directions in R2 and you choose multipliers, alpha one, alpha two, in such a way that the product is equal to one and the alpha i's are less than one over epsilon. Here, I, I restricted myself to the function P of epsilon equals to epsilon to the minus one half. But this is the same set as before, the same set that appears in the discrete mean value characterization of Monchamper. So you choose the orthonormal vectors and you choose the coefficient. And then the position of the game, you toss a coin and uh, an incredible coin with equal probability one over two n in R2, you toss a coin such that to the probability as one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth of the four possible new positions of the game and you move one step of size epsilon times the square root of alpha i in the direction of the vector bi I, as a plus or a minus. So you, you take one step forward or one step backwards in this direction of one step forward or one step backwards in, the, in this direction. And when you play, you get some money for playing. So you are quite happy. You, you get this amount of money. The amount of money is quite small if epsilon is small because you have this epsilon square in front. It's one half epsilon square f of x naught 
is the running payoff that you fix at this joint level. Okay, so you continue. After you made one movement, you continue playing and you obtain a second point and you obtain a third point and so on. And you get a sequence of positions, X0, X1, Xj. X0 is fixed, you start somewhere, but X1, X2, etc., are random variables, are random points because they depend on the coin tosses, on the probability one over two n that you fix here, that you have here. You don't know where, where you are going. You know that you are going to any of these four points with equal probability. Okay, you continue playing until you exit the domain. And when the position of the game exits the domain, you stop. And then you have to pay, and you have to pay a lot because you're not multiplying by epsilon square. You pay the amount of money given by G of the final position. So what do you want to, to, to do if you want to, to maximize your profit or you want to minimize the amount of money that you're going to pay? You want to stay inside the domain in regions where F is big. And if you have to exit the domain, you want to exit the domain at regions or at points where G is small. This is what you want. Okay, so if you do this and you compute these random variables, this is the total amount of money that the player has to pay. You pay G of the final position, but you collect, so there is a minus, you collect this amount of money at every play until you exit. So this is the sum of all the possible uh, movement that you are making inside the domain. What is a strategy for the player? The strategy for the player is that you choose what to do at every at every possible movement so you choose at every move at every play you choose the orthonormal basis and the coefficient that you have to multiply and you have to use to, to do, do the next movement and if you fix the strategy so you decide at every point in your domain what you are going to do provided that you arrive to this point so which directions are you going to choose and which multipliers then you can compute the expected value started at, starting at this point using this strategy of the total amount of money that you have to pay. And uh, of course, if you are a clever person and you want to minimize because you don't want to pay. That, that's the, this, this slide and says, okay, the value of the game is called it in this way in the literature is the infimum among all possible strategies of the expected value provided that you play with this strategy starting at x naught, and this is a function. Now this u epsilon is a function that depends on two things. Depends, of course, on the point x naught, and depends also on the parameter epsilon that controls the length of the, of the steps that you are making. Remember that you can, you can choose the alpha i's, but they are all multiplied by epsilon. And you cannot choose alpha i's in, in any way that you want. You need that the product of the two alpha i's that you choose is equal to one. And we also have this restriction. Okay, so far so good. This is the game, this is the value of the game. And uh, the, the key thing or the key fact in this stuff is that the value of the game verifies a, a, an equation. And the equation is the following. Outside the domain, you have stopped your game. So if you, are, if you have a point that is outside, the expected value is g of x. And, because the game ends, you never play. But if you have a point that is inside, the expected value at that point is the expected value provided that you made one movement. This is the amount of money that you collect in one movement. And this is the expected value provided that you make one movement that is the average among all the possible positions that you have. And then you compute the infimum among the coefficients and the infimum among the orthonormal basis. This is what you can choose at each movement. So, and so this formula holds. And this formula is exactly the same formula as the discrete mean value. Here is the discrete mean value thing, right. except for the little law of epsilon square. Willy has a question. Come on. No, 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 I was just going to point out that it looked very much like something you had showed us before. Yes, it is exactly this formula, except for the little law of epsilon square. So you remove the little law of epsilon square and you have a function 
u epsilon, for every epsilon, you have a different function that verifies the mean value formula, except that you don't have the little of epsilon square, and the function depends on epsilon. Okay, then, then you, you can conjecture, of course, you can say what is the theorem that, that follows. The theorem that follows is what you expect. The, this sequence of functions u epsilon converges to some continuous function uniformly in omega up to the boundary. So you have a boundary gate as well. And the limit is the unique viscosity solution to Mon Ampere in the interior because you have something that is very close to the asymptotic mean value formula, except that the little law of epsilon square is not there. You don't have the error there. And the boundary data is equal to G because your function in the exterior of the domain is equal to G all the time. So you have a way of approximating your, your function, your solution to mon Ampere equation to this problem, to this PDE problem, with a sequence of functions that came as value functions of a game theory, or if you want a, sol a solution to the dynamic programming principle that is associated to the game. So now the, this is a, a comment that uh, all these three things are equivalent. And this equivalence holds for a lot of equations and in a lot of, of circumstances, I will comment a little more on this, but this is like, this is not a theorem. It should be a hope or, or something that you want. And it holds many times, many, many times. So a function u is a solution to a nonlinear PDE. If and only if you have a mean value property in some asymptotic sense, probably, if and only if there is a sequence of games or a game in which we have a parameter and such that the corresponding solutions, the corresponding value functions u epsilon that are solutions to a dynamic programming principle converge to this function. So you have that the three things in general are equivalent, are the same thing. So being a solution of a partial differential equation is the same as verifying a mean value property, because we have this if and only if, and it's the same as having a game that approximates this thing. And the key point here is that the dynamic programming principle is like the mean value property, exactly like the mean value property, except that you are dropping the error term. You are dropping the epsilon square, the little o of epsilon square that appears there. Okay, this, this approach is quite robust. Very, very good, because you can do it in very different ambient spaces. All my talk was about a, a Euclidean domain in Rn, but you can, you can talk about uh, Riemannian manifolds. You can also deal with the Heisenberg group, which is a strange monster in which derivatives do not commute. So you don't have this, uh, the, those is a non-commutative monster, but you can do this asymptotic mean value formula and playing games in the Heisenberg group. You can also deal with graphs, especially with infinite graphs that are called trees that are very regular, and you can study equations in these trees. And you can also deal with metric measure spaces because for the mean value formula to hold, you only need a, a metric to define what is the ball of radius epsilon and a measure because you want to see what is the mean value of u in the ball of radius epsilon. Okay, you can deal with different nonlinear PDEs and this was my first intention when I, when I was trying to prepare this talk. This was to list all possible nonlinear PDEs for which this program works. But uh, later on, I decided, no, I just go directly to Mon Ampere and I present all the results with full detail or with some detail for Mon Ampere. Okay, it works for the P Laplacian. You have an asymptotic mean value characterization of P harmonic functions, and you also have a game for the P Laplacian, for the infinity Laplacian as well. It works for the mean curvature flow. It works for parabolic versions of the previous results. So for the parabolic P Laplacian, it also holds. And it holds for some special system, but in, doing, in dealing with system, the coupling between the components of the system, it's not any coupling. It's a, a very special coupling for the moment. So it also works for systems. But what are the restrictions? What are the limitations? Because you, can, you may say, Julio Ross is saying that you have an asymptotic mean value formula for every possible PDE. No. Unfortunately, no. It's only for second order elliptic PDEs. That means I can, we can do up to second order stuff 
an elliptic because we need some monotonicity on this uh, relation uh, between the second derivative. So monotonicity in the matrix is a, a key thing here because we are using viscosity theory to, to characterize all this or to deal with all this. So this is a limitation, uh, but this is a limitation of the theory as well because for non-elliptic uh, uh, PDEs, the theory is much harder. It is much more difficult to look for existence and uniqueness of a solution. But when you have ellipticity and you have second order ellipt elliptic PDEs, ell elliptic or parabolic if you want, but the key point is that this has to be monotone in the Hessian. But, but this is a restriction. So the, the, this general meta theorem can be expected or can be done for all these equations in all these ambient spaces and different things, but only up to this uh, restriction. Okay, there's, there's a bunch of names that contributed to the, to the theory or that contributed to games or that contributed to, to other things. In, in this list, this list is far from being complete, but in this list, uh, you can see that there are people from PDEs, from partial differential equations, like Caffarelli, Figali, Jutinen, uh, Parvianen, uh, Fernando Charro, Carlos Esteve, and so on, and Miranda, Manfredi, Marta Lewica as well. But there are also people that came from probability, that is uh, Perez, Ram, Sheffield, and Wilson, that are probabilistic people, that uh, look, uh, initiated this, this stuff of, uh, joining games with uh, PDEs studying the infinity Laplace. Okay, now references concerning this, you have two books, two recent books that deals with the interplay between game theory and PDEs and uh, carry on this stuff of designing a game for which the values of the game approximate solutions to the PDEs. And this, this, uh, this first two, two books that appears quite recently, one last year and the other one the year before. And uh, the last reference is the one that contains uh, not, all, not, not all the results that I presented you today, because this contains the mean value property for the elliptic version of Mon Jamper, but there you don't, will not find the parabolic versions. And you will also not find the game, the game interpretations, but you can look there if you want to see more details in the proofs. Oh, okay. So thank you very much for your attention. It was a great pleasure to give this talk. And I was uh, just in time. Ah. Ah. Done. OK. Thank you very much, Julia, for your presentation. Is there any, any other questions in the audience? You can just open your microphone or or maybe write it on on the chat as you want. I I, I strongly prefer that you ask questions uh, online, live, yes. say, and muting yourself. I, I have a couple of questions. Maybe if I, maybe the people will take courage a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, one question is, Julio, do you know if it is possible to use this mean value? Properties, asymptotic value properties to deduce from there, like such things like strong maximum principles or or hard like inequality. We 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 are we are able to prove for Mon Champer the comparison principle follows from the asymptotic mean value mean value characterization. So if you don't want to deal with the comparison principle directly for the equation, for to put mm -hmm. uh, this one. Instead of looking for the comparison principle, arguing in the, for, with the equation, you have a super solution, a sub solution, and you compare, compare them on the boundary of the domain. You want to compare them inside. This is true. This is known for the equation, but you can deduce it for uh, solutions using only using the, the asymptotic mean value characterization. This, this is true. One, one thing that uh, one wants to, to have is that if this mean value characterizations imply some regularity of the, of the function, because if you have a viscosity solution to mon Jamper equation, assume that you have a continuous function that is a solution to mon Jamper equation, continuous, only continuous, if the right-hand side is smooth, then the solution is C1 alpha or something like that. I don't remember exactly which is the regularity, but you have 
more regularity than only continuous, just for being solution, viscosity solution to this equation. You may ask, okay, I can deduce this slightly better regularity for functions that verify the mean value formula in a point-wise sense with a little of epsilon square. And this is something that I don't know. But well, we are trying. It should be nice to have something like this because you are not using the equation. You are using just using the mean value yeah. formula. On the other hand, the result is true because you have an if and only if. So if you have yes, it for the equation, okay. it has to be true. You are looking for something that has to be true, but trying to find a different proof of regularity. Um, the, yes. the, other, the other question that I have, ah, sorry, yes. May I? If you, uh, yes, had, you, you were first there. Oh, well, the, the other question that I have is, to, is to, if you have some results, uh, similar results but to fractional equations, integral differential equations or problems like that, well, the, you think the, that program can be applied there? For, for the integral differential equations, you have this uh, paper by Caffarelli, Borgian, and Figali that deals with something that they call the uh, fractional infinity Laplacian in which you choose one direction and then you compute something in, which in this direction. And there are two players that one chooses the infimum among directions and the other one chooses the supremum among directions. So something can be done, but uh, for, for a local version of Morgian pair, I don't know. Uh, probably the, the answer is yes. Or... Ah, for, for the fractional Pilaplacian, they are, yeah. For the, for the fractional Pilaplacian, it's okay. For the fractional infinity Laplacian, this is paper by Caffarelli, Borlian, and Figali. Uh, for, for, the, for the fractional Laplacian, you already have a mean value formula because you have that uh, u of x is equal to something. You don't have this, but you have that u of x inside the integral. So you have something like it's a mean value property because you have an integral. This is defined as an integral. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for the the local version of Mont Champer, I don't know. So probably, probably, let me guess that it should be true for the, the non local version of Mont Champer that uh, Fernando Charro and Caffarelli studied. Mm -hmm. Because there is a matrix A somewhere that is involved, and you take the infimum among matrices. So the infimum among matrices also appears there. So this, this kind of infimum appears there, but here you are not computing the mean in the ball of radius of silence, you are computing some fractional integral, so some monster appears. Okay. And the, the value of u is inside the integral. But yeah, there, there okay, are no local, no local monsters as well. Thank you, Julio. Elliptic. Uh, with, yes, with, yes, yes. With, yes. The, with elliptic. So, yes, Willy. Yes, I see. Yeah, what I wanted to say is, <laughs> in the proof you gave us, that it is you, not a proof. Well, in the sort of, uh, uh, the yeah. viscose proof that you gave us. Uh, you approximate, you use the Taylor formula mm -hmm. and then uh, essentially prove what you want for the approximation. And then as you said, one has to be careful, blah, blah, blah. Now, uh -huh. uh, and this here you used uh, some formulas that you put in the previous uh, slide, yeah, that corresponded to checking, the, I mean, uh, to the effect of the of this mean value on the three terms that appeared in the Taylor span. Now, suppose ah. I want uh, uh, dn instead of d2 of f, or I have a formula that involves, uh, an equation that involves d to dn, say. And uh, so I imagine that one could compute one, I mean, one could extend this list of mean values to include all the, uh, the computation of the mean values in all of the... Uh, for, for, our, for, our, for, our, for our proof to work, yeah. we need up to second order because we are using some monotonicity of this determinant of D2U in the, in the D2U. Because to, to deal with this approximation, one to, to, to make the real proof, to make a 
when you say a, well, a proof of this thing, yeah, yeah, you take. have to perturb this, this determinant of D to U, you have to perturb D to U a little bit up, a little bit down, and you need this to be monotone with respect to these perturbations that you make. Yep. For <laughs> higher order things, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. And, and I strongly believe that it is not true. You, you can formally perform Taylor expansions, but you cannot say up to which, uh, up to which extent the, the resulting mean value formula characterizes solutions to the corresponding PDE, because you want a solution to the PDE at the end. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the uh, question is- my, my question should have been, with this method, uh, huh? what can, uh, if you have uh, n bigger than two, how far can you go? The, the, that would be the, the, the question. I mean, can you do no, no. something similar with, with, with an O of uh, epsilon to the n or no? No, no. Mm -hmm. with, with these ideas, we are only dealing with second order equations like this one, second, up to second order, and only with functions f that are monotone in the, in the matrix of the second derivative. So we need the two things. We need up to second order and monotonicity the Hessian. But uh, that's yeah, well, one can conceive monotonicity with respect to higher tensors. Yeah, sure. but. But when you define viscosity solutions and you touch your function from above or below, the function that is touching from above, you don't have any control of the fourth derivative, for example. If you have at a, at a smooth function that is C infinity, that has a minimum at the origin, you know that the gradient vanishes, that the Hessian is not negative, but about the tensor of the fourth order derivative, you don't know nothing, so you don't have any order there. So even if the function is monotone with respect to the fourth derivative, you don't get an equation that is nice in this sense. You, you see what, I'm, what I mean? Mm -hmm. bit. What is behind this, this stuff of viscosity solutions is this fact that a smooth function that has a minimum at some point has zero gradient, and that the Hessian is not negative. So it's, it's like this. But about the fourth order derivative or the sixth order derivative or higher order derivatives, you don't know nothing. So. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, if anybody, nobody has more questions, we thank Dr. Rossi again. Julio, thank you very much. Oh, the contrary. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Thank you to to the audience for being.